We know that the context of Arthur Miller's Crucible in 1953, uh, we're in that McCarthyist era, right? A few years between 1950 and 1953, where we see the expansion of communism. We see the threat of communism uh, kind of uh, going into the Western world, um, and which is kind of, as we know, represented by America, right? The capitalist America is seeing this threat of communism following the end of World War II in 1945. And when kind of the dominoes start to fall, dominoes starting to fall, more and more countries uh, actually become communist. We see it happen to China as well um, around 1949. Um, there's a fear. We see the Korean War break out. And that, that's the kind of, uh, there's a sense of fear that, that is prevailing around America. And we see uh, the figure of McCarthy, Senator McCarthy come in and actually starts conducting uh, the, what was analogous to the Salem uh, witch trials, right? Um, but he starts uh, having these communist trials where he starts putting people up and accusing people of being communists, right? And they start taking radical measures to actually uh, impart fear in the whole of America. And, and they almost are basically turning everyone against each other, making everyone suspicious that, you know, their neighbor could be a communist. Just like back in the days of Salem, right? Late 1600s, people were made to fear others for being a witch. And they started accusing each other and buying into you know, things they knew to be false. Uh, and, and we definitely saw that because uh, America didn't want to fall into the trap of communism. They wanted to preserve their capitalist and democratic freedoms, you know, supposed democratic freedoms. Uh, but you'll see the paradoxes come out and all the freedoms that are actually taken away from the collective in that circumstance. Yeah. Uh, that the great communism itself. Yeah, that was the paradox. Right. For paradoxically, the freedoms that were being relinquished were far worse than the threat of communism itself. That's right. The... That's right. And the links, and I guess the, the broader link there I was going to say was, and just to start us off, is that the collective, right, were being turned against each other, right, um, by having one another demonized, right, basically being labeled as communists, right? And we call yeah. them the other in this context. Yeah, and I guess though, but even I guess before touching into that, I think that there is a connection which can be made between the fear that was being leveraged in McCarthy's world and the fear that's being leveraged now. Because unlike, you know, to link back to 84, the fear against or the hate towards East Asia and Eurasia, it's an ideological fear, which is quite similar to the fear of COVID, right? Because it's something that it's like a concept, it's ubiquitous, it's omnipresent in society, and you're kind of thinking that it is like witchcraft, right? It's this spell that's floating between, it might kind of rasp your mind and make you a communist. Mm -hmm. In the same way that this coronavirus is ubiquitous, it's floating, it's being transmitted, and it might then make you sick, which, which will make you a threat to other individuals. So I thought even before getting to how individuals were then fragmented and turned against one another, it's worth noting, okay, what was actually the cause of the need for this to be happening? It was the threat of communism. Well, what kind of threat is that? It's an ideological one. Its form as being quite abstract can be likened to the form of COVID. So I think that's like a nice kind of starting point. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I think individuals were then turned against one another because dobbing somebody else in or labeling or pointing the finger, I think as Proctor says, um, towards somebody else is what then I guess, cleanses you from being labelled a communist, right? Because to turn somebody else in was seen to save yourself in some sort of way. So I think yeah. there's a... You're, you're seen to be engaging in the, in the very kind of, you know, that accusatory process that the government actually is encouraging. So you're not, you're not part of the problem as soon as you point the finger at someone else. You're actually part of the perceived solution. That's right. And the accusing finger becomes the marker of truth as opposed to an actual popular investigation of how one can really discover whether one is a communist or has been spreading communist propaganda, which wasn't actually properly trialled during the text. Yeah, elements of, you know, reasonable doubt and evidence were all thrown out the window. It became the accusatory finger, which was the marker of truth. That's right. And I guess an interesting kind of distinction uh, there is that people were worried, I guess, going even back to the time of Salem, of people, someone being a witch, um, yeah. They were, and then going to Mac uh, the McCarthy era, right, 1950s, they're worried about being, the person being a communist, right? That's but right. then now, it's not, so, it's not so much, and you might argue that people are scared of people with coronavirus, but I don't really think we're seeing that happen where people are uh, necessarily scared of the person in the same sense, but you might, you, potentially that could happen. But it's more, you're being made to fear people who are not abiding by the rules that would help prevent having the virus right I, I think it's i think it's kind of a little bit more nuanced than that i feel like it's fear 
against, yes, other people who may actually be silent transmitters of the disease. So you are fearful of coming into contact with someone. And I think it's hate towards those people who aren't trying to limit circumstances which may transmit the disease. I don't know if you agree. So I feel like it's... No, that's, what I, that's my point. My point is that the fear is not so much at the person having it. As I said, it's, it's about the person who's not abiding by the rules who could yeah, then be spreading it. And, yeah, and, and, my, my interpretation was more hate towards people who aren't trying to prevent the spread and fear of an unknown person who might actually be a transmitter. I see, I see. Yeah, yeah, kind of both of those, I think, are good points. Um, that's right. So, but, but more the hatred going towards the, the dobbing in is the people who are, oh, they're not sticking to the rules. Uh, and right. therefore you're, you're therefore kind of um, exonerated from anyone, you know, thinking that you might be the issue. It's like, I'm not the issue. I'm, I'm pointing out them. Look, I'm, that person's doing it, right? Um, yeah. so, so you're not, yeah, go on. I was gonna say, it's almost like an element of human uh, jealousy in that circumstance. It's all, it's a bit of like, well, you know, I'm here, I'm sacrificing, I'm staying at home. You shouldn't be allowed to have fun in numbers because I'm giving up my liberties. Though so it's a, an element of hate, it's jealousy. Yeah. Oh, sure. It's a bit of FOMO. There's a lot that's kind of going. <laughs> oh, that's a good point. That's a good point. There's certainly a, a resentment that can be bred from this situation when someone's seem to be doing their part or they perceive themselves i'm doing this i'm making the sacrifice as you said uh, why are you not making the sacrifice because we're so con so dependent on everyone doing it together that uh, and again it's going to one of those kind of uh, you know i guess paradoxes or inconsistencies but in a collective effort you know those who divert uh, you know you're trying to why are we even doing it why are we all making the sacrifice so that we can all like you know for the welfare for the well-being of the community and yet in that process as people divert right? You're actually going to point the finger. There's a lot of resentment that comes out of this process. By the end of it, you, you actually, uh, you really don't, it's not like you have admiration for everyone that you'll have a lot of bitterness towards certain people. And yeah. uh, that, that it's kind of a divisive situation in that sense. Uh, and, that, and you can see that in the crucible as well, right? If, you know, everyone feels okay. If you're on the other, if you're on the safe side where you're, you know, you're pointing the finger, I'm all good. But if you don't want to be associated with the other group of people who, you know, at the end of this are going to be the ones who people, uh, you know, resent, as you said. That's right. But I guess um, I, another kind of distinguishing factor here is that our isolation is for a productive purpose, which is to prevent the objective spread of a disease. Whilst when we look at the reasons for turning individuals against one another and promulgating hate in the McCarthy era is to prevent the spread of communism, which wasn't really proportional to the measures that were being taken at that time. And in fact, the spread of communism was being leveraged by McCarthy to reinstate his own authority over his context. So much like 1984, there is this sense of infallible power or power for the sake of power more so in 84 than in Miller's context, but McCarthy was still being a totalitarian figure. So again, we can see, yep, there are these connections which can be drawn between how society is functioning, but we're hoping that the reasons for why isolation is functioning in our own world will remain only for productive purposes. So there's the distinguishing factor. But I think maybe bringing it back can to- add, Sorry, can I just add? I was just gonna say, it's an interesting point because you know it's, it's actually coming from a place of hindsight and retrospect that you say that the means were disproportionate. But had things gone different, I'm sure people at the time would felt it was completely proportionate. It's completely reasonable. I, we don't want communism in our, the fear felt at the time was so immense yeah. that it's that kind of crisis that would justify anything being done. Uh, so, yeah. And I think, well, also the reason that Miller chose witchcraft in the Salem witch trials was because at that time, people actually did believe witchcraft was a real thing, hence why it was meant to be a very kind of historically accurate use of an allegory. But I guess my point is from our standpoint, when you're trying to connect to our world, I'm just weary of saying that what's happening now is what was happening during Miller's context. But yeah, go on. Yeah, so yeah, it's not, it's not that it's wrong to say that, it's just an interesting point to say, at present when not disproportionate because they would have felt like it wasn't disproportionate as well. And I'm sure they would have been made to believe that. So it'll be funny. Uh, well, I shouldn't say funny, but it'll be interesting in, you know, 10, 20 years to look back and see, was it proportionate? Was it yeah. proportionate? So it, it's something that is, uh, we're approaching from a different uh, kind of point on the timeline of the actual crisis. Yeah we don't have the benefit of hindsight in our time but someone as clever as miller in his own context had the benefit of hindsight without actually having the benefit of hindsight yeah right, in terms of that's that's right and that's an interesting link to the the next point about the allegorical value of it right 
because Miller had the hindsight because he looked back hundreds of years ago and said, hang on, this has happened exactly the way it's happening now. He saw it and he, and he wanted to put a play on about it because he saw how fear can be um, kind of ingrained in, and, and spread throughout a community and people can be turned against each other and it can be done for the wrong reason and then the power can be exploited and people can be made to fear each other. And again, when you have people fearing one another, the community is atomized, they're alienated from one another. And that gives the collective no power against the people who have the power, who've been vested with the power. What, for a reason that people believe to be legitimate, we want the government to have power in this situation to fend off communism. We want the theocratic uh, you know, head of, of, of the community. You know, we have that theocracy. We want the judges. We want um, you know, the head of the church or, or whatever the relevant authority is. We want them to have the power to deal with these very widespread problems that no individual could do. But we don't want them to then use that power in a way that actually prevents any of us from actually challenging them and holding them accountable. So McCarthy right. saw that parallel between people accusing one another of witches and the way they were driven against one another and the way they were all weakened and they all lost their agency and they all were buying into a lie. They were calling people a witch when they knew they weren't a witch. And mm -hmm. the same thing happened with communists. People would call someone, uh, sorry, I should say, the same thing happened in the McCarthy era where in America people are calling another person communist with no proof, right? There was no substantive grounds for those accusations, but they did it to take uh, kind of the focus off them for someone else. Uh, and I guess he had that benefit of the historical, that a macro historical hindsight. Um, and That's I guess right. we now have the benefit of not only that, but also uh, Miller's text as well yeah. to kind of look, yeah. you know, look at our situation. Yeah, and I think maybe just two points that I wanted to add on that. The first point was in terms of the way that Miller is representing the individual's fear of communism, there was also this kind of internalised questioning of self during the time as well. So people were actually because they weren't really versed on what communism really was and what its objective threat was, people were second guessing whether they actually were communists themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think what I wanted to raise as a segue from that is what Miller was really fighting for was the individual's use of consciousness, right? To be conscious and to question the political systems to which they're subject. And I think that people like Miller and Orwell are uh, to thank for us being on our toes and to questioning, okay, how long is this current legislation going to be in place? And how long are we actually going to be under these controlling measures? What we're doing here and having this sort of dialogue is exactly what people like Orwell and Miller were fighting for us to be able to do in the first place. So I think that's another point to add on there as well. Yeah, that, that's a great point about this kind of evolving and, and like this, I, I should say this historical continuum, right, of, of consciousness. <laughs> Yes, I, that's, I actually had forgotten what one of my points was, which was the notion of history repeating itself, right? Yeah, and how cyclical nature. The cyclical nature of power and its abuse and how he kind of used that to inform his reading of what McCarthy was doing, yeah. That's right. And uh, the, yeah, I was just going to say basically, and with, with that cyclicality and with increasing awareness, you have this historical continuum of consciousness. Uh, and, you know, many believe that with the evolution of the, the human species, right, we become more and more conscious. Um, mm -hmm. I say many believe, of course, we're more conscious than our kind of ancestry in terms of, you know, the, the types of animals that we used to be. Um, but when, as we come more and more into the future, we think we're, our, our consciousness will be heightened, right? So uh, it's funny to see that. And now that we have, you know, authors as conscious uh, and aware of these issues as Orwell and Miller, then now it's coming more common practice to just immediately question these things. Uh, and as soon as you see the threat, which, which is kind of an optimistic way of looking at it. And maybe I'm Kind of you know warp in the reality of all of this but the point is that the more you have these things i know history does continue to repeat itself but if you can have a, a greater sense of collective awareness each time you go into a moment like this where where those freedoms become imperiled if you can have that heightened awareness on a collective level each time a little bit greater then perhaps the you know potential damage will lessen in terms of what it can do to your freedom at least your liberties and your, your, your political activism. Yeah, for sure. Not to say the result won't be worse because every time we hit these crises, you know, technology also goes up and the potential for greater destruction uh, goes That's up right. simultaneously. But it's certainly in terms of the awareness of how power could be abused. I mean, that's something uh, that, you know, history will continue to remind us of. And But texts, the power of a text, such as a, a dramatic text and a play that is so visceral, right, in, in, that's performed in front of you, the power of those texts to continually prompt us at the same time as history presents these challenges, text will also present these potential avenues of redress. 
That's right. And also kind of enunciating the enduring values of texts themselves, right? The questions that they raise. Yes, they are provoked by certain contextual elements, but they remain, like I said earlier on in the clip, they answer these perennial questions of human existence. They lie at the heart of what it means to be human, hence why they have this kind of continuing importance to what's going on, despite us living in different or contrasting contextual circumstances. And I think that's what human experience is all about, right? That there are different elements of what make us or what kind of inform our individual human experiences, but what unites us are these enduring and transcending values, which these texts really capture. And what we're trying to do in this video is to show you that your own contextual circumstances now should deepen your understanding and empathy for that precise enduring value of those texts. Yeah, well said. And I think people have to, especially students who are watching this, who are, who are studying HSE, just be aware of that point in the rubric that talks about, you know, the, the composer themselves as someone who's a participant in the process and how you as a responder or a participant in the human experience that is actually being explored, right? Miller presents his text as Orwell, you know, in 1984 presented his text. Um, as you're confronting these texts, you're actually invited to embrace, right? That, that the, the struggle, but also the solution. You're meant to be there to have the heightened awareness after reading or consuming the text. And therefore you become part of the very solution that the composer is trying to offer as a, as a result of actually creating that text. Yeah, and you're encouraged to reflect on your own experiences and use those to connect with the world of the text themselves. So it's a whole, it's a very meta and involved and active process that you're meant to engage in reading. You're not meant to be a passive reader and to distance yourself from the words of the text, but think about how they inform and in fact you can integrate your own world with what's happening in the world of the composer. Yeah, yes, so I think- yes. And no, that's good. I was just gonna add one other point on that, that just that idea of being an active reader uh, you know, when you when you consume these texts or look at them in class, try and immerse yourself in the emotions that were actually felt by the characters as well, because that's uh, that's very much part of it. Uh, I know with a play, you you know, with a, a play that's being performed in front of you, as I said, it's visceral. You see it, you feel it. But also, uh, when you read any text or watch a or a film, uh, you can really you immerse yourself in it and feel those emotions because those texts are being very deliberately constructed to actually impart those emotions on you and therefore give you the insights and into how uh, those people and characters would have felt and therefore the the actual dangers and, and the and those aspects of the human experience that are being explored you can feel it yourself through the form yeah. of it but you have, certainly have to go into the text as an active participant as you were saying yeah, so just to kind of enunciate that even more clearly, so what we're trying to say here is consideration of the textual form and how the form invites you to engage more deeply with these human experiences is absolutely crucial to the way that you structure your essays. And as Johnny pointed out, the very interesting part of Miller's choice of form and why he indeed chose to write a play is because unlike any other text, there's a heightened realism which is associated within that particular form. And there's also a collective aspect to the experience because you're part of the collective audience membership when you engage with the text. So you want to think about those elements as very particular choices that composers have made in order to convey these enduring human experience values which you use to construct your essays. Very good. Well, I think that's a good wrap on connections between crucible human experiences and COVID-19.